Well, I'm going to cover our, is you know talking about now shotgun metagenomics um, and how we annotate that so that we get both taxonomic profiles and, and functional profiles. Okay, so just to do my one slide comparison between you know six nest and metagenomics. I mean, people usually consider metagenomics better. I mean, it is more expensive, so more expensive usually is better. But there actually is other pros and cons just besides. Um, you know, you get more data. So obviously, we talk about we know what six nests is. It's targeted sequencing of a single gene, uh, and from that, you basically get taxonomic profiles. Uh, it's really well established. It's relatively cheap, about twenty dollars for about fifty thousand sequences per sample right now. Um, and another benefit that often doesn't get mentioned is it only amplifies what you want. So determining on what you're what you're doing. You might actually get host contamination, which can be a problem with, with metagenomics, right? So if you're in, say, biopsy samples or maybe even skin samples, if you do shotgun metagenomics, which is basically the sequencing of all the DNA in the sample, right? So instead of just a single gene, now you're getting, you know, the metagenome, all the DNA from that sample. And all the DNA in the sample means, yes, there will be a lot of microbes, but there could also be... Um, you know, host DNA, and since only a few cells, we have a lot more DNA in our cells and microbes, it doesn't take much to actually contribute to that contamination, right? So for example, I'm going to show you a little study we did where we actually really want to still do shotgun metagenomics and biopsy samples, so we sequenced the snot out of it, and then 95% of our data was, was human, right? Um, so the only way to really get that around that is, is to do sort of sequence that right now. Um, but of course, there's benefits to metagenomics as well. There's there's no primer bias. So this idea we talked about different variable regions, you have to pick a variable region. Um, that goes away because in theory, with shotgun metagenomics, you're getting uh, no bias in the DNA you're getting back. Another big benefit is that you're actually getting all the microbes. So if you want to go beyond bacteria, uh, you don't need a different primer set. So with primer sets, we often do ITS for fungi or uh, maybe an archaea for specific 16S uh, uh, PCR primer that both metagenomics you get you know a snapshot of all the all the microbes you get eukaryotes and, and viruses uh, and then obviously the other big thing is that now you get a catalog of the reads that are contributing to to genes and then you can annotate those genes as functions and then ask not just sort of who's there but also the question about what are they doing right but but both have their uh, advantages and disadvantages. Okay, so just to sort of give you a little bit of taste, I guess a little bit of science for what I'm doing before I get into the technical details of how we annotate sequences, I wanted to highlight this study. One, because it, it talks about 6 and SMA genomics, and then it also touches a little bit on how we're using random forest uh, machine learning in, in our lab right now. So it's a little bit of a teaser for, I guess, the second half where you'll be learning more about machine learning. So basically, in this data set, really quickly, uh, we're looking at pediatric Crohn's patients. Um, so these patients weren't treated yet, so they're treated naive. Um, and we took biopsy samples, and as I just mentioned, we wanted to do shotgun metagenomics on these patients. So we have shotgun metagenomic sequencing, and we also did 16S sequencing on them. And then what we could do, which is how the project actually started, is we took this 95% of the DNA we were just going to throw away, um, and we actually called SNPs with it, which was kind of nice. It's a nice side thing to be able to do this. So all from one sample now we have SNPs called for human genetics, we have the shotgun metagenomics, and we have the 16S. Um, and then we basically collapsed most of these SNPs into what had already been um, made a, called the genetic risk score for IBD specific. So this has been associated already. So from this risk score, you basically get a single number, a, a measure of your risk for developing Crohn's disease. Um, and then from the 16S and shotgun, you can basically get these tables, right? So we talked about OTU tables, but you can collapse these things into your different taxonomic ranks. Uh, at both for metagenomes or even classified as into, say, uh, functional things. So in this study, we looked at keg, and I'll talk about other functional databases in a couple minutes. And then with the OTUs, we looked at, uh, again, all the taxonomic ranks. So we looked at all these tables, uh, and then we also looked at alpha diversity, <laughs> and, and we also inferred, actually, uh, functions from the 16S data. So we had all these little tables, and we actually asked, you know, what is the best for predicting one, who has disease, who will, who has the disease or not, healthy controls. And then also we had follow-up data, so we know that half our patients basically go into sustained remission. 
uh, and the others don't. And so we wanted to figure out, you know, based on a baseline microbiome profile, could we figure that out? I'm not going to go into machine learning in depth because that's going to be covered really well. But the idea is we have these feature tables, uh, which again could be O2 tables, genus tables, functional tables. We have labels, and so we're testing two different things. One, if they have disease, and also their treatment outcome. And then for this, we're just leaving, doing leave one out validation. Um, so the first question we found was basically for uh, classification of CD versus control. Basically what this shows is for each one of those tables I just mentioned, the accuracy that we get from the random forest method and uh, the stars just indicate significance. And then you see the 16 up data in dark and the MGS data in, in green, in that genomic data. Uh, so what you see right off is that, you know, even though we did all this metagenomic sequencing uh, for, a, for quite a high cost, for 95% of the data was human, we actually didn't get significance uh, at all except for the genetic risk score from the human SNPs. Um, but we did get about 84% accuracy at the genus level from the 6NS data. So, well, that was interesting. Um, and then what else is nice from random forest uh, and some other machine learning methods is you can then get what are the most important features for that prediction model. Uh, and so this is just a, a ranking, basically, of those different features. And say if we just zoom in at the top, you get uh, indication of some of the bacteria at that genus level that are either more uh, associated with uh, Crohn's disease or lower in Crohn's disease. Uh, and some of these have been previously associated. Yeah? I mean, for the random forest, you feed the whole, uh, the whole uh, taxa level? Uh, we feed it, in this case, we just tested each of these individually. Yeah, so we're testing each one of those tables individually. Uh, but then we did do a combination as well. So then the next thing. Because some of them could be going to yeah. yeah, absolutely. So obviously the accuracy is quite late related, and so when we look at, say, the phylum features, which is quite high, are obviously related to the same genus features. Yeah, so we do see that they're, they're obviously quite related. Um, and then also we did this idea of just combining the data, right? So instead of doing it separate ones, if we start to combine features together, and does that give us a better predictor? Uh, the better predictor, not so much right now. We're still sort of testing it out, but it's like we may have gotten an extra one or two percent accuracy. But then what's nice is you get this <coughs> sort of relative abundance of accuracy and how much those contribute. So you see eucinophilia, this is from Acromantia species, it's the most abundant, but then obviously that's been this within this phylum, so those are quite related. But then you see this particular K ortholog group, which is a, a functional gene, uh, and how that's related. You see genetic risk score, which is the human genetics component, is one of the least important factors. And so it's kind of uh, interesting to see how these, these features come together. Anyway, sort of moving on, because I don't want to spend too much time on the, on the science. But um, the more interesting question for us is whether if we could predict who's going to respond to the treatment that they were receiving or not. Uh, and then so at this now, you know, the metagenomics started to come and play a little bit more. Uh, the genus level is still slightly higher in the 6NS data. But now all of a sudden we do see a class and final level from the metagenomic data, significance for determining who might get, uh, who would go into sustained emission. And then when we look at the most important features, what's even more interesting is that all of a sudden the things that you wouldn't pick up from 16S data, like viruses uh, or microbial eukaryotes, pop up in our, our interesting features. And so we're using that as a way to sort of uh, pull out interesting uh, taxa, and now we're starting to actually do more viral stuff to understand you know, how this how this comes into play and focusing on that one. Okay, any questions about the little science vignette before I move on to the technical details? Yep. Yeah, sure. Then if you're going to cover this in this section, perhaps, so how much the 16S have the antigenomics Not in terms of the association with the outcome, but in terms of the uh, That's a good question. Um, we didn't do a, like a real rigorous test on that. Other people have looked at that. If you put them on, like, say, a PCA plot, they'll be really separate. Um, I guess I can't comment on from this study. We didn't actually try to, to merge and say how how well did they correlate. So I can't give you a correlation score. But other people have. It's it's not super satisfying sometimes. <laughs> so I can really say about that. Uh, but I can't give you an actual argument. So when you're comparing the 16S and metagenomes, what is the depth of sequencing for metagenomes? For the for the metagenomes, so yeah. we just yeah. So we did um, about uh, sorry, should I just numbers right off? About 100 million sequences for the metagenomes, and so we were getting left about 5 million sequences after filtering for human 
Okay, yep, so you've got five million bad genomic sequences. Quick question here. What was the average depth? The average sequencing depth per sample? No, yeah, four, four, just for me. Sorry for what? No, I'm just I'm just wondering about your your MGS data. What's yes. the what's the sequencing depth for average sequencing depth? Yeah, that's that's what he has. I think it's the same question. Uh, it was hundred million sequences per sample we we had sequenced. Ninety five percent of those were mapping in human, so it left us about five million in theory micro metagenome reads. Is that what you're asking? But you can no, take a couple of I, One more you, could, you could calculate the sequence yeah. coverage, depth of coverage is like 20x, 30x times each sequence or base was sequence, which you can quickly do it on the sequences. I, I see, so coverage of the genomes genome. within the metagenome yeah. for the microbes, mm -hmm. yeah. we didn't calculate it. Yeah. But it's, it's just okay. like one simple calculation. I'll be adding some stuff about that. Yeah, yeah. thanks. <laughs> okay, so I guess to back it up after giving a quick, uh, quick jump into science. So, you know, the, I'm going to start with the question of if you have metagenomic reads, the first thing you want to do, just like with 6NETS, is you want to find out who is there, right? So what taxon what taxonomy are there? Um, so we want to find the relative abundance of, these, of this data. Uh, and so there's problems associated with this that makes this difficult, right? So the reads are obviously all mixed together. We don't know. That's the, the fundamental problem. We don't know what reads came from what cell. Um, the reads can be short, so that's problematic as well, right? So we're working with 100 to 150 base pairs before people used to work with 50 base pairs. Um, lateral gene transfer can obviously, both ancient lateral gene transfer and more recent lateral gene transfer can really sort of bugger up taxonomic profiles, right? Because if you think this read comes from a gene that is in this organism, but then it's recently transferred or transferred a while ago, then, then that, can, that can make taxonomic profiling hard. Um, and with most of this data, metagenomics data is fairly large, and so computational time can, can make things difficult uh, if you're doing a lot of similarity searches. So I try to group, this is always kind of hard actually, to, to two broad approaches, I guess. So one is this idea of binning or assembly, so we're using all of your reads to then do a taxonomic annotation, uh, which I'm going to punt completely to Frederick, and so we're going to talk more about methods from that angle. Um, and then I'm going to tackle more of the idea of uh, different taxonomic <coughs> profiles from sort of marker-based approaches, where you're, you're using particular markers within that data set to figure out the taxonomic profile. Um, so just as one, one slide, I guess, before Frederick will cover some more detail, but they're, from the binning-based approach, there is composition-based methods. So you heard a little bit about using KMERS, or uh, you can even think about the sort of GC con percentage, uh, and 90 base classifiers that do this. So composition-based methods are, are fairly fast. You can also do sequence-based, which is then you're doing some sort of blast or similarity search method to a large database. Uh, and so common tools are like Kraken uh, or other approaches. And then from that, you're using, using the best hit or some sort of lowest common ancestor. Uh, and then uh, something based will be covered by Frederick completely. OK, so the other approach is this marker-based approach, right? So in almost the simplest case, you could think of just you know taking the 16S reads from your metagenome profile and then just piping them through sort of chime the way we would do it normally. Um, and so that's that's possible, but then you're you know you're using one single marker and you have all this data, so it seems quite wasteful. Um, the other approach is to basically use several genes, right? So the idea is you're picking genes that are well conserved, fairly universal. Um, and so that approach is taken by, it was taken by Fala Sift uh, there in Darling in 2014. So they used 37 universal gene coffee genes. Um, so that's like taking 16 nets plus a whole bunch of others. Uh, and then the other approach is to look at maybe clade specific markers. So these aren't universally everywhere across the tree of life. They're genes that are found only, they're taxonomically restricted. So they're only found in a, a certain subset of species. Uh, and then if you use that as more like a biomarker approach, you then you can maybe uh, identify your taxa that way. So that's the approach used by uh, Metaflan and Metaflan 2. And so I'll be going into a little bit more detail about, uh, about Metaflan 2. So I don't think I need to get into marker bidding. They both really have advantages. One of the advantages of those uh, marker approaches is that um, they're fairly fast. So bidding approaches tend to be more computation intensive because you're dealing with all the data. And so that involves either assembling all the data or doing similarity searches across uh, all your reads. Um, 
And then varying genome sizes or LGT can actually sometimes bias those results. With marker-based approaches, uh, yeah, they tend to be faster because then you're only searching across a few markers. But the downside is that you don't actually get to use all your reads. So you don't get to sort of bin them together. You can't do anything like genome reconstruction where people are trying to pull genomes out of their metagenomes. Um, and then obviously with the marker-based approach, you're really reliant on how good those markers are. And so that's some of the downsides of the marker-based approaches. So, so, so both are really relevant. Okay, so the tutorial that I'm going to give is, is talking about Metaflan 2. I, I have nothing to do with Metaflan 2 or Hemon 2. I feel like it's not like I'm a fanboy either, but it's just, uh, I mean, I haven't developed any of those methods, and it's what we use basically in our lab. They satisfy our, our needs fairly well. Um, so, uh, disclaimer, I'm not pushing my own software at this point. <laughs> Tomorrow I'll do that with PyCrunch, but not now. Okay, so, um, so why Metaflan 2? So, uh, as I mentioned before, it's relatively fast uh, because the database is, is much smaller than it's nice it has markers for bacteria, archaea, uh, microbial eukaryotes, and viruses. It's fairly widely used and tested, which is you know not always the best disclaimer for using a tool, but it's nice because it's less likely to have bugs, I think. You could probably correlate you know, ease of use maybe with how much it's used. Um, quite a few tools have compared to Metaflan 2, and so it's you know it's always up there in the mix, right? So people come out with new methods and compare, and they're usually better because that's how you get published. Because otherwise, you don't get published. Um, but at least it seems to be in the in the right area. It's never like one of the lowest. Um, and as I mentioned before, the main disadvantage is that not all the reads are assigned uh, a taxonomic label, which means that you're heavily dependent on uh, Metaflan 2 having all the markers of things you care about, right? So if you had, you know. 20% of your sample dominated by something that you know we've sort of never seen before, you wouldn't you wouldn't know because Metaflan doesn't even pull those things out, right? So you don't know about how much the percentage of things that's not there. Okay. Um, Metaflan uses these clade specific markers. Uh, there's a lot of them, and <coughs> nice thing is that you can identify down to the species level and even sometimes to the strain level. Right, so people talk about this a lot as, as another advantage I didn't talk about between 6S and metagenomics. 16S, you're going to get down to maybe genus pretty reliably, sometimes species, you know, but not, not really reliably with names. Uh, and with metagenomics, in theory, we can get down to strain level, although in practice that's, that's also pretty hard sometimes. But at least the data is there that we, in theory, can get down there with. You know, you could have 100% similar 16S sequences, and those things could represent 16S strains. There's just no more. There's no more resolution there. But with metagenomics, it's easy to Next thing is it's also relatively fast. So you can, you can run Metaflan 2 on your sort of desktop computer or laptop and basically get a taxonomic output in a few hours. So that's an advantage, obviously. Um, so the whole idea here is with this marker-based approach, you're basically looking for you know, genes and how they're distributed across uh, your taxonomic or phylogenetic tree. So this is just an example of a core gene in clade Y. But it's not unique to that clade, right? So it's also found other places. So that's not a very good candidate. <coughs> Whereas what you're looking for is a gene that's unique to this clade that's not found anywhere else. The thing you might jump to in your mind, you should probably, is what happens if we, you know, there's a genome out there we've never sampled and it's found over there, right? The way they sort of get around that is that they don't depend on just a single marker to call something a, an organism. They'll, they'll use multiple markers to hopefully make this prediction more robust. Um, most of this selection of these markers are all done offline in this thing they call Chocoflan. Uh, and then when you actually are getting your reads, you're basically just taking your reads, uh, your quality filtered reads, usually not assembled, uh, although in theory you could assemble them first. Uh, and then blasting them, or not really using blast, but usually using bowtie 2 as a nucleotide search uh, against their database of markers. And then you're getting out relative abundances. <coughs> I think I just said all of that in text. Perfect. OK, so that is about Metaflan 2. And I'm now going to talk about functional composition stuff. Any questions on the taxa assignment idea? Yeah, quick question here. So the Metaflan is also the related strain plan. Is it just that for the strain level of the heavy you can Yeah, so it's kind of weird. They have at least too many flans for me. but uh, <laughs> so. Strain plan is, 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 under my understanding, is actually implemented by Metaflan under that package. But the thing is, they wanted to call it something different when they came up with it. So, yeah, it's essentially by default when you get strain applications using strain plan. That's my understanding. If anyone knows different, please let me know. Any other questions? 
Yep. Uh, I'm not sure like the accuracy of the uh, in the meta plan by for different niches can vary because this meta plan usually be instead of the human microbiome, right? So uh, if you're using like ruminant microbiome or other niches, I'm not sure it can be different in accuracy because of the reference data Yeah, yeah. I, that being fair, I have seen them do quality accuracy against other other data sets, not just human. It definitely has been sort of more anchored in human, where there's, there's really good reference genomes, which kind of lends you towards this micro-based approach in the beginning. But it's a fair assessment, absolutely. Yep. Okay. Okay, so moving in beyond taxophone, right? We want to figure out, you know, what really, what are these things doing? And, and what functions is different across the communities or maybe between healthy and disease? So, you know, one of the big questions you ask is sort of what, what do I mean by function, right? I mean, people talk about function and it, it's not very precise. So they could be talking about things in general as photosynthesis, you know, nitrogen fixation, glycolysis, carbohydrate metabolism, that's very loose. Or they could be uh, talking about specific, uh, you know, gene families, very tight gene families. So they could be talking about, you know, a particular gene within nitrogen fixation, FH. Or they could talk about a particular enzyme uh, that's, that's well known, like alcohol dehydrogenase, or a particular you know butyrate kinase, which would be involved in butyrate synthesis, but it's a specific gene, right? So what you'll find is when you're doing this annotation, usually you're doing annotation at some gene level, right? Because reads map to genes, and then there's usually a step after that where then you're taking those gene predictions and then mapping those into modules or pathways, depending on the database. And Boy, is there lots of databases out there. This is only a sampling, and sometimes I add to this, and sometimes I take off. Uh, so people have probably heard about COG. It's, it's been out there for a long time. The classification was originally made in 2003, uh, but people still use that as an annotation system because it's quite convenient to map still reads to that, to that system. SEED is, a, is the annotation system used by RAST and MGRAST, um, but they have their own families. PTAN has been out for quite a while as well, so these are typically shorter domains. Uh, but they do sometimes have gene length uh, protein families as well. Keg has been super popular, even though it went uh, private now uh, four years ago, I think, at least. Um, it's popular because if you've ever seen a metabolic network, usually on a poster somewhere, it's typically it's often been Keg in the past. So they have this really rich annotation for their gene families, and they map those into these modules and pathways. Uh, and so the, the nice side of is if you get a hip to the Keg, you're going to know sort of what it's doing, and, and you have rich annotation around that. Um, Metacyc has been really up and coming, and it's, it's, I think it's starting to finally maybe replace KEG a little bit. Uh, so Metacyc is similar to KEG, but you can map genes to modules and pathways, uh, to <coughs> modules as well with Metacyc. Uh, it tends to be more micro-focused, which is nice, uh, and they, you know they're continually updating it. I know they threatened of going more Requiring a license, I don't know if that ever came through or not. Does anybody know? I think they're still completely open from last time I checked, but hopefully they still stay open in the future. Otherwise, it's okay. Uh, and then UREF is this other approach where basically uh, instead of a rich annotation system, this is just the comprehensive search, right? So where you're, with K or Metasite, you're restricted to genes that are well annotated. UREF really covers uh, many, many gene families, millions of gene families. And they're basically just clustered into these 100% identity, 90% identity, or 50% identity. UREF 100, 90, and 50. Uh, and so it's nicely updated. And so basically, if you're looking for a really rich <coughs> searching for everything, your chance of getting reads mapping to that is the highest. <coughs> OK, and so this is my short second vignette, uh, taking away from the, from the technical details a little bit. So people have probably seen these plots before from the HMP paper, where they talk about taxonomy variation compared to functional variation. Uh, and then the take-home message really is that usually, well, functions are more conserved or more stable compared to taxa. Uh, so what's interesting, this is at the phylum level. Uh, and then these are like high-level uh, keg pathways, right? So the comparison is, is maybe equivalent, because phylum's a pretty big group. Um, but it's, it's really hard to compare taxa and function. And so we sort of looked into this a little bit deeper to say, OK, you know, is this a really product of just the database they're using? Is it just because it's a K database, or is, is, is our functions always more conserved? Um, and so Carl actually worked on this here in the front row. You can ask him all the stringy details uh, if you don't like it. <laughs> but 
what we did is we just took 10 HMP gut samples. Uh, we plotted basically the break currents dissimilarity between all pairs, and then just plot that. And so we, you know, found that, like you would expect, that if you go down to a species or strain level, that you start to see more variability, right, between your samples. That makes sense. And then we compared that to CAG, which, sure enough, we sort of recapitulated that figure I just showed you, where, sure enough, pathways are much more similar to each other across those samples uh, and are even more conserved than, than phylum. So that's not, that's not basically what we found. But then we wanted to ask, what if we use a more comprehensive database, like UNIREF? Uh, and then so when we map the UNIREF 50, 90, or 100, basically now all of a sudden we're getting a lot of variability. So is the functions more stable than taxa? I don't know. <laughs> and I don't think it really matters, right? I mean, I don't think it, comparing functional stability versus taxa stability is, they're two different things, right? Uh, so this is actually a more philosophy-oriented paper uh, that's in review right now. But the take-home message really for sort of practical sense of this, right, is it depends on what you're looking for. So if you're looking across uh, samples, you might have to go into the variability of these UNIREF protein families to see the variation that you're interested in. Uh, or maybe, you know, maybe you're looking at really differences, different types of microbiome samples, and so the differences you see in K pathways might be enough. Um, yeah, that's my take home message. This is just descriptions about the K versus UNIREF a little bit more. Uh, and as I mentioned, basically, there's a lot more UNIREF entries compared to K. Uh, and then, as a product of that, a bit is that most of the UNIREF families are unique to a, to a certain number of taxa. And so they're not shared across a lot of taxa. Yep, in the back. This could be a very basic question, but I'm wondering about the functional categorization. Is it based, is it looking at sort of similarity of a sequence to a particular se reference sequence where that is annotated as an alcoholic hydrogenase? Is it based on that? Because there's <coughs> a lot of mistakes in the annotation of genes. Oh yeah, yeah, now there's, Annotation problems is a whole other problem, even on top of all that. So um, this is kind of looking at the, the comprehensiveness of the different databases, right? So you have some databases that are well-created, or more well-created, but are limited. So KEG has like 15 to 20,000 protein families, and UNIREF is in like the tens to millions of protein families. But what is it actually comparing? Because if it's a protein, of, if it's a sequence of a protein of unknown function, how is it comparing it to any well, uh, it's, it's telling you that even though you might not have an annotation for some of the UNIREF 100s, yeah, a lot of them are unknown function. But at least the idea is that you would know that this unknown function keeps popping up over and over again. So if you limit yourself, say, to only the keg, right, and you're studying you know, healthy disease, whatever you want to choose, you don't even get to see those families to see if they're different in the first place. Whereas maybe if you include a more comprehensive database, yeah, you don't know what it's doing, but if all of a sudden, you know, it keeps popping up over and over and over in Crohn's disease or whatever, then maybe that protein family is worth following up and annotating somehow. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure uh, that Keg uses some form of side loss. Yeah, I think people can annotate to Keg in different ways. So. Yeah. Great. Okay, so uh, moving on towards sort of annotation system. Again, there's lots out there. So there's web-based ones like sort of bigger servers where you just upload your data. EBI has their own metronomic server. MGRAS has been around for quite a while. IMG out of the Geno Joint Genome Institute has their metronomic server where you upload data. Wait, infinite amount of time. No, I don't know. It usually <laughs> takes a while, like seriously a long time sometimes. And then you get your results. It's a bit of black box. Probably not my number one choice. Um, Megan's been around for a long time. It's more web interface GUI right in front of you, not to a server. Uh, it's usually based on you doing some sort of blast search and then feeding that into Megan, but the nice thing is it gives you some nice visualizations. Uh, and then there's lots and lots and lots of local based approaches here that they come and go. So Metamos was, uh, Meta Amos was ba based off a sort of assembly configurable pipeline. It seems a little buggy and I haven't seen updated for a little while. ShotMap came out from Tom Sharpen's group uh, a couple years ago, which was nice because it normalizes counts by leads per kilobase. Uh, so I'll talk about this in just a little bit more detail in a second. Kraken also came out, which allowed this fairly rapid searching. Uh, and so it focused on being able to you know, take a custom database of genomes and then allow your, your, your search fairly fast so that they meant it will be covered by a group. Uh, and Humon2 is what I'm going to talk about in the tutorial and, and go in a little bit of detail. Okay, so why again, so why is this so complicated, right? So there's a whole bunch of reasons. Why can't I just 
blast against NR. So one is you could do that, but chances are there's going to be a few problems. So one is that it's going to be too slow. So if you take your metagenome with 10 million sequences and then you try to blast NR with, I don't know how many sequences they're up to in NR, but it's a lot, you're going to wait for like forever. Even with your supercomputer, it's going to take too long. So one approach is then you use some sort of speed up technique. So Twitter's going to talk about the assembly based idea. But if you're looking at pairwise sequence searches, Diamond came out a couple of years ago. It's you know sort of in the five to ten thousand range uh, speed up over blast. So that's one idea. The other idea is your, your top hit might not be the real thing, and so how do you get around that? Maybe you start to weight all the hits that are significant, and so you weight the top one the most, and then you take that into account. You have, could have bias from the gene length, so your chance of just hitting a longer gene is, is, is larger, because if it's, if it's longer, you have twice the chance of hitting it if it's twice as long. And so you have to take that, uh, those, that, read length, that gene length into account when you're trying to then contribute, calculate your relative abundances. And so that usually gets uh, resolved into this reads per kilobase. And so that's how they normalize it. Um, usually, <coughs> unless your metagenome is quite uh, restricted taxonomically or your metagenomic sequencing up is really high, you're basically not going to sample all of your genomes to completion. Um, and even if you do, there's chances that you're still missing genes. And so you're going to miss genes just because your sequencing depth is too low. And then how do you get around that if you're trying to figure out pathways? And so one approach is to sort of do this gap filling approach where you say, well, I have nine out of ten genes in this pathway. Chances are we probably just missed it, so we'll say it's, it's there or we'll, we'll try to bump it up to some sort of level and see if it completes after that. Uh, and then the other thing is around, you know, if you have lots of genes mapping to different pathways, how do you find the minimum set of pathways that explains that? And MinPath has been around for quite a few years, and it's actually one of those tools that still is continue to be used, so it's, uh, uh, it's quite nice for doing that. <coughs> okay, any questions while I just, before I go here? No? Okay, so Human 2 actually didn't get published yet, and I've been holding out, uh, I used to teach Human 1, and then, um, I was waiting for the paper to come out. It still hasn't come out. <laughs> but I read the paper, asked for it from Curtis Eisenhower. Um, so I get a chance to read it, uh, and now people are starting to use it and publish their data sets ahead of time. So I thought I'll go over Human 2. Um, <coughs> it was also nice that they actually just lent me their slides, which saved me a ton of work. <laughs> so Eric Penenza made these slides, and so I'm just walking through just a couple of them from their, from their larger presentation. OK, so the whole idea with Human 2 is that um, you have basically your reads here, and they're dividing their reads up into four sort of examples here. So they have species one and species two, which they know about. They have ambiguous ones or things that they don't really know what to call it. And then they have completely novel sequences that they don't have uh, any information about. So the first step in their pipeline is to actually use Metaflan to basically find out what the taxonomic profile is. And so they use a subset of these reads mapping the specific genes to come up with this taxonomic profile. After that, what they do is once they know that, okay, in this case they have a blue guy and a yellow guy, sort of yellow, that they'll make a pan genome out of uh, the taxa representing that. And so they'll make a custom database that then they search um, the rest of their genes against. So now they're searching all the reads against these and they're basically doing recruitment to these genomes. And then, if there's still reads left over, which are this, these ambiguous ones, and also still the completely novel ones, their last step is then to take uh, those <coughs> reads and now do this translated search, like a blast X or translated search, against UNRF 90. So it's this large, comprehensive database I just talked about. So there's sort of two major advantages to this. The first is that they make a link between taxa and functions, which is quite nice in the output. And the other big advantage is that it's faster because they screen out a lot of the reads to this smaller reference database that they basically make on the fly. Um, their only downside right now is that basically their novel sequences that are still left over, they don't do anything with. So those, these are sequences that they don't know the taxonomic profile for, and they're sequences that had, didn't hit this large comprehensive database. They say that. These would be perfect for maybe doing some sort of assembly or some other approach afterwards. So you do some de novo sequencing clustering and then try to do something else. But they don't they don't touch those in this, in this framework. Does that make sense? Okay, so the output sort of looks like this. So the idea is that 
um, you get uh, back uh, some sort of label. So by default, uh, you get back UNRF 90 clusters. You get a G name for that. And then you get this total gene abundance, which is this normalized count based on means per kilobase, and it's taken into some of the other factors. Below that, they collapse also how this is. So you can actually get stratified and unstratified. So unstratified basically means you would just get this first line uh, of information. If you want to stratify, you get also this information where they know particular species, how those counts are contributing to that function. And then they also know the unclassified proportion of those within this. So these all basically sum up to this 600 number. Does that make sense? Great. They also get, they map these UNRFs to Metapsych, and so then you get pathway abundances basically or coverage. So coverage just means you get a one or a zero if it's covered by that microbiome. I don't usually find that, that relevant to tell the truth. But then you also get this abundance for this thing. And again, you get this either uh, unstratified version or you can ask for a stratified version where you get the breakdown of that pathway by the species within that sample. Uh, one of the nice things from the paper, um, and sort of I'm interested in following up a little bit, and you can get from this data, you can also get this from PyPress, which I'll talk about a little bit, is this idea of functional diversity or um, they call it contributional diversity in the paper. Um, I don't really like the names, so maybe we'll come up with something different if I do. But the idea is you can then look at particular functional groups and you can ask, you know, is there per sample uh, functional diversity low or high? And then also, is there much uh, diversity for that functional group between samples? So this is what these axes are indicating. So this is an example of low sample diversity uh, for this function because it's dominated mostly by one taxa. And it's also fairly consistent across the samples that you're looking at. This is an example of high uh, between subject diversity, like this, uh, where it's dominated mostly by a single species, but that single species changes a lot. You can also get this uh, idea of high between diversity, but still dominated mostly by, uh, sorry, this is fairly consistent across the samples, but it's dominated by a lot of different species. And then lastly, where you have just a lot of changes both in within the sample diversity and in the cross sample as well. So I think it's really nice because this starts to move us into, I think, a direction we've been wanting to go for quite a while in the field where we're starting to look at, you know, not just what functional changes are, but how, what tax are contributing to those functional changes. And I think, you know, Human 2 gives us one idea of this. You can get this data from PyCross, and I'd like to see other tools do this as well so we can start to look at how, how do we handle this data better, right? And, and how does that link to sort of biology? Okay, so uh, if you're really in the pipelines, this is the pipeline of the, of the data again. It's, I'm, I don't think I need to walk through it, but the idea is you're inputting, I guess I will walk through it, you're inputting, well, okay for time. Yeah. You're inputting quality control DNA reads, similar to Metaflans, so these are raw reads, I'm sorry, uh, FASTQ files of reads that have been filtered and quality checked. Uh, you're doing taxonomic profiling with Metaflan 2, and then uh, they're using this TAN genome database, which they call Chocoflan, and now they're getting basically reads and map to those organism specific hits, that gives them that stratified information. Any of the reads that didn't get mapped go into this alternate pathway where they're doing this diamond search against UNREF. And then they basically combine that back together and then look at how those uh, genes map the pathways within Metapsych. And you get three major sort of outputs from that. So you get gene family abundance, uh, pathway abundance, and pathway coverage. So their default is for UNREF 90 to Metasite, but the nice thing is you can also map to things like CAG still, I think COG as well. So it's sort of a, gives you a site into multiple things. All right, any questions about the algorithm? Yeah? And uh, to that, can you have some option to say is that function related to that kind of sample group, or can you associate a function with, a, let's say, disease or antibiotic use or whatever, or just descriptive? So this is just mostly focused on providing that annotation, and then you would usually use those tables afterwards to do some sort of statistical test to ask what you're getting at is then, you know, do you do a simple sort of t-test across all your protein families, or do you do an ANOVA, or do you do some other parameter or some other statistic to figure out what functions are statistically different? I don't know if we need something new for this whole stratified data thing, but I have to think about that more in the future. So usually what happens is you just treat each functional group as, as separate things that you're testing, and then obviously you can count for multiple test correction. Um, and then how to test for 
you know, so the functions could actually now be the same between diseased and healthy, but you might have a different taxonomic makeup of how that how that's made up. I, I don't know how to test that yet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the back first, yeah. Uh, so they're assuming, sorry, yeah, that's a good question. They're assuming you did that beforehand. So you would have to pre-screen your reads, not just for quality, but also for uh, contamination for. Sorry, that's a good point. And in the tutorial, you'll actually do that. So usually you'll use Bowtie, or you could use EWA, whatever your favorite mapper is, and then you just download, if you're doing human genomics, you obviously just download the human genome. And one, there's one that's combined with Viax as well, which is often used in sequencing. <coughs> but obviously if you're doing mouse or paddles or whatever you want, you'd have to obviously screen out contaminants that way first. Yeah, quick question. Yeah, it's just a competing class before that is needed to run this new. Uh, computational power? Yeah. It's actually fairly good. So that's one of the things I talk quite a, quite a bit. Um, so, do you actually do you have an idea, Carl, from how I took this? Uh, the subsample agent? It's in the hours range, right? So you could do a, you could do one sample with a regular amount in probably an hour or two, I think is what I saw. So scale that up for how many samples you have. But you definitely, this is just on a regular sort of computer chat. Well, it depends because I tried running it on like 15 gigabase data sets and 48 hour was not enough on the setup I use on our supercomputer here, but I need to try it on another that has more cores for, yeah. uh, for, for a node. Yeah. But it depends on the size. Yeah, obviously. Because it's linear on the size. It is linear on the size, the, the number of reads in your in your red genome. Yeah. Good question back, yeah. Um, just to clarify, I was trying to correct you because the taxonomic limitation would be limited by the amount of records you need to this functional database. Yeah, sorry, what was the first part of the question again, though? Would it be restricted to those pan genomes? Taxonomic limitation? Yes. Yeah, so you're limited by the what you know. It's the same limitation as Metaflan, so that's what it uses. So your stratification of the functions is limited to what Metaflan knows about, which is limited based on the genomes you have in databases. Um, but Human2 will then put other reads that it knows is a particular function into this unclassified category. So you still get the functions from the things you don't know what they are. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay, my last slide is not, I should have taken it out, but uh, sometimes I harp on little small things. So just a, a small thing, obviously, I think John's going to talk about metatranscriptomics, but just the idea that we're measuring here like DNA, so we're measuring the presence of a gene in a sample, we're not measuring <coughs> transcripts, we're not measuring proteins or metabolites. And so my always caution is just to be a little careful around your language when you're talking about things, things because we're sort of assuming a lot of times that the increase of a particular taxa with a gene is then actively doing that, right? So people talk about, about say, a butyrate kinase, and then that leads to, well, maybe short-chain fatty acids are increasing. But we don't know for sure, so it's just language around that. Yeah, quick question in the back. Yeah, related to that, um, when you see the comment that you uh, pointed out to me that we never really take into account the dead versus alive problem, right? And uh, he said apparently there is algorithms available that, you know, depending on how the DNA is sort of digested, how it looks, you can make a conclusion, you know, which of the bacteria are actually alive and which were just kind of dead. Can yeah, so you, you have a comment about that? Is that already implemented in some of these algorithms? Because it's important since only the, there's a dormant a microbiome, there's dormant bacteria that don't really do anything, don't contribute. Yeah, so obviously the, the easiest way to get around that is to do metatranscriptomics. Because uh, <laughs> then you're, you know. In the genomics, what they did is basically they the sequence in the 5 prime and the 3 prime, and then they, you know, that's how you okay. begin to do it. But I, I, I don't know yet. Yeah, there was a nice uh, paper, I can't think of the name, but where they did flow cytometry on cells, and so they sorted based on cell characteristics to get dead or alive, and then looked at the taxonomic profiles within those. and. Obviously, showed there was actually differences, right? So it would affect it in some sense. 
Um, it was from the third ball I have. Uh, was that third ball? Yeah, it was Kevin mm -hmm. Lovis, the, the first ball. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was really nice. I, that was a really clear example. But from just straight from DNA, I think it's, I haven't seen anything really conclusive. It's pretty tough. The guys, the guys that the sales, the guys that are linked to the DNA with the cells <coughs> are dead. In our lives, we pull up the type out, so we can sequence them. Oh, is this the where you cross link the DNA within the cells? Yeah. And then you do sequencing? With the bacteria cells. Yeah, I don't know. Would that really solve it, though? Would that tell you if it's alive or dead? Maybe. We can do this. Maybe. It's live or dead. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the only thing that comes to mind is this. Uh, I think it was IREP, which is this idea of um, you can measure replication rates within genomes. So you take many genomes, um, and then you look at the basically the, the, the coverage of that genome, and then you can get an idea if it's replicating or not. It sort of gets that doesn't really tell you if it's alive or dead per se, but it tells you if it's actively replicating. So that's one other tool. Yep, I'm all done by the way. So, so as a follow up, how long does a bacterial liquid type? Remains in the gut for So the question was, uh, I mean, the previous question on distinguishing dead or and live bacteria. So the bacteria is live and the nucleic acid is within the gut environment. How much does it exist? How long does it exist then? Uh, for quite a while. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's the problem, right? So especially with stool samples, a lot of what we're measuring is, is DNA from cells that are dead. But you can make the argument that. At least it's maybe maybe representative of what's happening upstream, where you don't really care what's happening right before it's passed anyway, right? You care about the cells that are alive, so what's upstream. But that's a whole other question. A little bit. So I, I don't have I don't have a satisfying answer besides it is significant. Though. I don't know if anyone knows percentages, but. So where does this number come from? Well, so from the from the Turnbow paper that I think that was from stool samples, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, so they use slow cytometry and then use markers on the cells to figure out. There's two or three different ways to measure basically cell. Um, I don't know. Probability. Yeah, probability things like that. So I can't remember the percentage from that paper, but I can look it up and uh, post it somewhere. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'm around. You can ask more questions. I'll let Frederick talk about his stuff. Uh, so I'll be talking about assembly-based metagenomics. So, uh, well, first, I'll go through a bit of the three levels of interpretation that it would, I think that we can have about metagenomics. It's like looking into the library of someone. So this is one of my bookshelves in my basement. And if you want to know what's in my bookshelf, then you can do culture. You take one book and you read it. So you isolate the bacteria, and then either you measure how it grows in different media, or you sequence it and get the full genome. So you know lots of things about this single bacteria, this single book in this uh, bookshelf. The second thing would be like just to scan all those barcodes. So then you would know the titles and others of each of these books. So this is basically doing the 16S, the taxonomy of uh, the 16S. So you find the names of the bacteria in there lineage uh, that are found in the library. And you can also get some metadata. This is a science book, this is an oral book, this is self-help, this is business, this is science fiction. Uh, so this is the same as using PyCrust on 16S to know a bit of the function based on which taxa are in there. So you know a book by Stephen King, well you may guess that it's an oral book or something that may be akin to an oral book. And then there's the third part, the complete metagenome, where you take all the books, you rip them off by pages or by lines or by little strands. And then you try to make sense of that. So you pick strands and strands of paper. And then you say, this comes from a king book. Because in my reference database, this sentence I know is reference to a king book. And, uh, and so on. So you're able to get information on the taxonomy and on the content. So you can look in, uh, in language analysis. They take what well, this. There's a champ I don't know what's it in English, but these are words that are within the same frame of mind. So if we talk about stool, about feces, about poop, about, uh, you know, there are many synonyms <laughs> <laughs> that we can use for that. So uh, you can get more information about the books by looking at this kind of information that we get. And if someone is parsimonious, he can take all these little shreds of paper and like do a jigsaw puzzle. And that's what the assembly softwares do. 
But before, uh, well, so basically what we do is that we take a bacterial population, we extract the DNA, and then we sequence everything. That's basically what we do in Jacob based lab. We try to measure everything, or at least the most uh, that we can do. Uh, and why do we want to assemble? Well, it's because the length of the sequence that we will be analyzing will determine uh, what information we'll be able to get. So if we have short reads, like very short reads, we'll only be able to map SNPs uh, according to a reference. Um, at 100 to maybe 500 nucleotides, we'll have short functional signatures, and maybe we'll be able to assign a specific origin like what the a human does or a metaflin does. At a hundred and at a thousand nucleotides, we can almost have a gene. So we're probably able to start to look at really complete genes. And then you go further. So if you go up to the tens uh, of thousands, then you get longer operons. You get uh, several genes that are side by side. So you'll be able to compare the synteny of the different. Uh, assemblies you'll be doing to compare to reference genomes. And if you go further and further, and you're able to look at prophages, pathogenicity island, mobile elements, and even whole chromosome organization. So the longer you get, the more information you have. Well, it all depends on what you want to do and what are the questions you are asking your data. And for these longer sequences, sometimes we're able to get them through assembly, but sometimes we need new technologies like at biosequencing and other uh, new sequencers that sequence very, very long uh, fragments. So one important thing when you consider assembly-based metagenomics, and it is true for any genomic sequencing that you'll be doing, uh, the sequencing coverage is one of the key factors. Uh, basically, you can calculate the depth by uh, taking the number of nucleotides sequence and you divide it by the expected length of the genome that you have or the metagenome. Uh, estimating the size of the metagenome, well, I wouldn't go into that. Uh, but still, it's an, an interesting metric. And we, use, we can use it in metagenome. Uh, I'll talk a little about it a bit later. So the optimal coverage of sequencing depends really on the application and on the diversity of the population you're looking at. If you want to be able to uh, get the genome of a bacteria that's 0.1% of your population, then you will need to sequence a lot to have enough read to be able to sequence uh, this. Because if you, if you will need 100 more reads to sequence something that's 0.1% of the population than something that is at 10% of this population. So there may be other approaches uh, that you can use. So the quality of your assembly will depend on the coverage you have and the complexity of the sequence. What do I mean complexity of the sequence? Microbes have different levels of repetition in their genomes. So if a repetition is a bit longer, for example, it has a repeated gene or a repeated mobile element that's longer than your reads, then you'll, be, you'll have a hard time, for example, in the pistis, you have lots of small contexts, or people working on parasites. Uh, got some colleague here that works on Leishmania. Uh, Leishmania is uh, uh, when trying to assemble because you've got so many repeated sequences that even if you sequence very, very deep, your genome will be broken in hundreds to thousands of contexts. So depending on the different bacteria, some are easier to assemble and some are harder uh, than others. So if you see this one is pretty easy because there are not many dots here, so not many repeated sequences, uh, and you get pretty long contexts, so 20 contexts. But then when you go to the others, there are several repeated sequences, so you get more broken down uh, contexts. And if to that you add a whole bacterial population that may share some parts of genomes, then it <coughs> may break your assembly even more. And the other thing is the diversity of your population. Depending on what uh, is contained in your sample, uh, you know the, my fingers microbiome is not the same as my stool microbiome. They don't have the same thing. And if you see here, this one right here is the stool. So they estimate that you need to have about maybe 5 to 10 gigabase of sequence. Well, I would say a bit more 
to get good uh, coverage. But still, you need in this range between 10 to 20 gigabytes to have something interesting to analyze when doing the assembly. But here you've got tropical forest soil, and then you get need hundreds of gigabytes of <coughs> sequence. So this is these are huge uh, microbiome. One of the big difference is that in the gut microbiome you get some bacteria that are pretty abundant, and then it starts to drop, and you have all those more ones. But in the soil, there is a lot of low abundance. So if you want to assemble things, you need to have enough uh, copies of the bacteria in the sample. In the gut, there are a lot of taxa that you'll be able to assemble because the distribution uh, makes it so that there are several that you have at 1 to 10% of the population. While, for example, in the soil, you have so much that are under this 1%, 0.1%, so you won't be really able uh, to assemble them. So the diversity of the sample you're looking at is very critical in designing your experiment uh, for uh, sequencing uh, to assemble. So here is a little, some slide that some, um, some work we did, uh, some validation on how much sequence do we need to get a, a good single, uh, to get good results. So this one is taxonomical profiling using Remeta. Re so it's basically the same, well, it's not exactly the same method, but it's the same kind of outcome that we get with uh, Meta plan. So as you see here, in each of these, there's a little bump in the beginning. And so before 8 million reads, because the first line, each little line that you don't see because it's too small and you're too far away, uh, so each of these little lines is 8 million reads. So once you get to 10 million reads or 16, then you're about flat and you get the right one. Before that, <coughs> you get a bit more error and your, uh, your quantification is a bit skewed to the ones that are, to the, the taxes that are more abundant. This is true for Remeda, so that's for Remeda, I don't know for, for the others. Uh, then, there's this other, yeah. So the difference is tiny, is that important? That's a good point. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> but you know, if you're here, if you sequence 500,000, uh, for example, reads uh, for, uh, using Remeta, maybe Remeta is not a good one to do your analysis. Maybe you'd rather go with another one. Uh, you need maybe more sequence, or you can trust those that are pretty abundant. But those that are less abundant, then you have lots of false negatives. So we did the same, well, the same data, basically, and we met, compared it to the size of the assembly. So as we increase the number of reads here for four different samples, we see that even at 120 and even 140 million reads, we're still not on the flat side of the assembly. So we haven't assembled everything yet. And that's normal because there are a lot of taxa that are under 0.1% uh, that are very low abundance in the gut and that we don't really see because these are stool samples or that we see very low abundance in the stool samples. So as we go deeper, we get even more stuff. But still, assembly is around uh, 200 uh, million nucleotides give us pretty much lots of stuff to work with. So we don't see everything, but we have lots of material to work on. But we'll be mostly working on the high abundance. Thing. So now I'll be talking, I'll do it in a part because I didn't put the slide there. But a thing we use to go deeper to get the sequence of the low abundance bacteria is that we use a broad culture, but a very broad uh, culture in liquid. And then we put stools, and then we sequence the culture. And then it allows us to get sequence from lots of bacteria that are not abundant enough. Uh, for example, in the microbiomes, usually we don't, we're not able to sequence E. coli because it's too low abundant. But if we do just standard culture in a, maximum enrichment for us, then we see the, a lot of the antibacteria. So that's a trick that you can use if you're not interested in the quantity, but in the genomes. Uh, so we chose an assembler. So there are two big uh, families of assemblers. There's the, the classical one, the one that does the jigsaw puzzle. So it like overlaps the reads and then it builds a sequence with that. Uh, people, not, people have not been working much on that. Uh, recently, although people are doing hybrids of this method and, and the next one, which is based on cameras, 
So we've been talking a bit about Kimmers uh, this morning, and we'll talk a bit more about that as the cool, of course, uh, grows on. So basically, you're breaking the sequence of a genome into words of a certain length. So we have a genome here, the smallest genome in the world. Uh, so if we break it in Kmers of length 5, then we get this collection of Kmers. And this can be used to build a graph. So if two Kmers are seen side by side, and they share their middle sequences, so then they'll put this little edge between them, and we'll be able to build a graph based on the uh, succession of the Kmers so this is uh, the method that many assemblers currently use. Uh, some of them are, people are currently working on mixing the camera with the more overall uh, alignment uh, methods of the, uh, of the overlap uh, layout consensus. Um, and there are several assemblers that are available. Uh, two of the many uh, very popular ones currently is uh, Metaspace, which has been published very recently, uh, and then Megaid, which is pretty much liked in the literature. In our case, we use uh, Remeta. Uh, Remeta was created in the lab by one of my former colleagues, Sébastien Boisvert. Each of these, there are some very bad assemblers. There are a few that are pretty good, so those that are here are kind of uh, pretty good, uh, but they all have their advantages and inconveniences. For example, for us, uh, we have a hard time using Megaid and Metaspace because they require lots of memory, and they, there's something, they, are, they can run in parallel on supercomputers, but they are not distributed, so they are not able to share the memory between the computer nodes. So if we have lots of sequences, and our supercomputer is smaller nodes <coughs> with smaller memory, then these won't work with big metagenomes as we like to use. So this is why we are still working with, this is one of the reasons, because there are others, uh, that we're still working with Remeda, is because this one in, is parallel, but in addition, it is distributed. So it, can, it allows to share the memory between the different computer nodes, which allows us to use big metagenomes. We just scale, uh, we just add cores, if the, uh, the metagenome uh, gets bigger. And there are several others. This paper, I recommend that you check it. Um, it was published in PLUS One uh, recently. It's a very good review of the recent metagenome assemblers. And this is a figure from this paper. Uh, so it's basically the same kind of analysis I showed previously. So this is the sequencing depth. And this is for the different assemblers, uh, the, the recovery of the genome, so the percent of the genome that you get. And for some of the assemblers, we get very good coverage of the genomes. But here, for example, this yellow line is Remeda. So for a rate, you need to have a good coverage to be able to assemble. That's one of the uh, drawbacks of the software. You need to be pretty uh, deep on the genome, at least uh, maybe between 30 and 40 to be able to get a good assembly of it. Um, but the other assemblers do not necessarily have this problem. Uh, so each of them has their advantages and uh, their drawbacks. And you may want to compare different assemblers when you do your analysis, depending on the type of data set, the available uh, computer infrastructure. So it's pretty important. So here I've got my dinosaurs figure. So if you see there are some of these plots that look like dinosaurs. So here on the x-axis, you've got the reads that are sequenced uh, multiplicated by the proportion of the bacteria. Each of these little putative dinosaurs <coughs> are, re are a context that potentially originate by a specific taxa. So if we zoom in, here we've got Enterobacter floaki, uh, Escherichia coli, Vectoridae aegypti, and Lactobacillus melanus. And here we have the quantity of sequencing that we think is probably associated to this bacteria, and then the assembly size. So we see that at some point, as we increase the quantity of sequence, uh, we're able to get the full genome. But before that, it can be a bit key. So I'll talk a bit about Remeta because it's a good software, and that's what we'll be talking about in the practical class a bit later. It's a good software to really get the feel of the different 
approaches that can be used to characterize uh, your context because it's pretty well integrated. So basically what it does is that it takes the reads, do a big airy uh, ball here, so uh, the moon graph, and then it does your assembly. But it also colors the assembly based on the recurrence uh, database of genome and taxonomy. So with that, uh, we're able to profile the proportion of bacteria that are found in the sample, and also to color uh, the assembly, so to tell which contexts come from which bacteria. So it makes the binning pretty easy. Uh, if you have a context that look a bit like what you have in the reference database, then you're able to infer from which bacteria it comes from. Um, one thing that we must take into account, though, it's not copies of genomes we're looking at. We're looking at proportions of gamers. So it's a proportion of sequence that's associated to bacteria that's it that we see here, not the number of genomes of bacteria that, say, that we have in a sample. Uh, some bacteria have genomes of 2 million, others have 4 million, so it's important to take that into account in your interpretation. And here, we can give it a taxonomy and reference genomes. We can also give it any functional collection that you want. You can give it sequences of phages, or antibiotic resistant genes, uh, any function that you want. You can count anything in your uh, airy the moon graph. Uh, there are softwares to evaluate metagenomes. There's the MetaQuest that's pretty cool to compare different uh, metagenomes to give you uh, the difference between the number of contigs and the size of the metagenome, the number of mismatches uh, when comparing to reference uh, genomes. This is, this is a pretty useful software when you're comparing and testing the different assemblers for your projects. And now that we have very cool metagenomes to work with, there are lots of things that, uh, that we can do. So I included four in this, uh, five of these in this uh, presentation. So first, we can just annotate the assemblies. So basically, we want to find the, find the genes. So we use the, in the lab, we use protocols that are, that are others uh, that are available um, by different labs. Uh, then you can use the genes that you found to annotate them. So either by aligning them to a reference database like Uniprot, or you can find domains using PFAM, or in some of our projects where we looked at the effect of antibiotics on the gut microbiome, then we align them to a reference database of resistant genes. So with that, we're able to ask questions. Uh, and if, if you're using a very a specific database, it's more manageable. Because if you compare to Uniprot, and you've got 100 million of nucleotides assembled for metagenome, it can take some time. Um, and then you can compare the genes that you found to members of a different, the same, members of this gene family. For example, you find a beta-lactamase gene, then you com can compare it to the other beta-lactamase genes that are available, do classical phylogeny, and you can look at the distribution of genes between microbiomes. So that is one of the ways that we used to do that. So we group genes predicted by similarity. So basically, we, took, we take all the genes, we label them per sample, and then we run a CD8 with a certain threshold of percent of identity, and then we represent their distribution in genomes or in metagenomes. For example, we see here that this batch of genes is present in almost all uh, the samples in our study, while there's a group here that is almost absent from uh, this group here. Uh, it's absent here, but it's present in all the others. So, well, I must com confide in you that this is not a metagenome, this is a Clostridium difficile deficit. <laughs> <laughs> but here you've got the NAP1 that is very common uh, and a big problem in hospital, and it is very convergent between uh, the different hospitals. So, this is a very, uh, it's like an epidemic that we had a few, a few years ago, and these are all the others that we. But you can do that on microbiomes too. And you can go even further in that kind of approaches. So here I have these little thing bacteria. And the question I want to ask is, are these bacteria representative? How do they compare to the, all the other thing bacteria in the world? So what I have here is in the Shirishia coli, so we found the resistant genes in the microbiome. So here you see there are several microbiomes for which we had enough stuff to assemble E. coli, and that was culture. 
Uh, and here we have others, so let's talk about the uh, microbiomes. So we see that there are several resistant genes that are present in all the microbiomes. And then I can run the same analysis on all the Escherichia coli in NCBI, so three to 4,000 uh, genomes. And you see it here. So here there are something like 4,000 genomes of E. coli. And you see that there are several genes that match those in the bottom and found in my microbiomes. Um, that are shared by every single strain. And these genes are, in fact, in the core genome of E. coli. So this approach allows us to say, okay, this resistant genes is probably not linked to clinical problems. It is normal to see it in E. coli. And then there are the others, like here, uh, that is found only in a few samples. So it is either associated to a strain of E. coli or to mobile elements. And you have here, you have the MC gene, which is a gene that is shared by all E. coli, and there are different subtypes. And you see that if you have, I just want to go touch the, touch the screen. <laughs> uh, you, have, you may have this, this gene, this allele, or the other. So people have either one or the other, and the same in the stream. So this is a marker of the clade, probably, of E. coli. So as we talked previously, we can do genome binning. Um, so the, the goal is, yeah? Uh, do you get, when you do your assembly, your, your Dinovo Dexia, for example, you call it a very good example, do you get many strains of E. coli or just one strain? Uh, it's possible that you get, for example, here, there are those that are darker. It means that you have more than one copy of the gene. So there's probably two strains of E. coli in the microbiome. So yeah, it's truly possible that you have that. But you could not infer, let's say, that uh, it, this E. coli strain, they, they, they have all pathogenic genes, so you cannot infer really phototype on E. coli or something. You know? Well, you could look for the pathogenesis genes and say they have that. But they need to be in, in the same, because E. coli, you can have one E. coli with just one, with just one virulent gene, and it's not considered yeah. pathogenic. But it, yeah, but then you can look at the coverage of the context. If you, and if you have your E. coli contigs, uh, that are like at 10x and those that are non x then you can infer that some genes are from the one at 10x and the others are from the ones that are non x by looking at the coverage. If you add more information, you're able to triangulate some, uh, some information. Uh, so do you have enough other questions? Yeah? So this is not the entire genome, but simply the genes, the resistant genes from the sample. Yeah, this was for the resistant genes. This was a kind of proof of concept because imaging all the genes sometimes can make a pretty big table. Okay, so now we'll be talking a bit about binning. It's, it's a bit related to, to your question about, uh, about E. coli. Uh, so basically what you want to do is that in your microbiome sample you have different bacteria and then you do the extraction, your sequencing, and then you are, get your samples all mixed up. All your little strands of of paper from your books, all the books are mixed up. Uh, so you do your binning, so you want to say, okay, these uh, sequences come from this genome, these sequences from, come from these genomes, and there are several ways uh, to do that. So the first one is the reference genome and taxonomy. Uh, you can do it by doing an alignment to a reference database, so doing blast, diamond, or uh, whatever. Uh, what we like to do is color them using camera, so I've already explained that, and all the results I've shown previously uh, on the on the binning and on the explanation of the different coverages of the bacteria was done using uh, this method. So as long as you have genomes in your reference that are close enough to what you're sequencing, then you'll be able to bin, to bin them. Uh, that's for sure that you may have some parts of genomes that you won't be able to bin because either you don't have it here or it's too, uh, it has too much sharing between different bacteria of different taxa. So this makes it uh, a bit more tricky. Another method is differential abundance. So you could, let's say, okay, well, on the x-axis, I will take GC content of my contigs, and on the y-axis, I will take coverage. Or you could, uh, what uh, the initial paper on that in Nature uh, Biotech in 2013 did, is that they used two types of sequencing that would skew uh, the coverage of the different genomes, and that allowed us to plot them and to separate uh, the, the contigs on between different um, between different 
position in, the, in this plot, so they were able to separate them. Uh, finally, there's one that can be used in the lab. Uh, it's been in using make pairs or long reads. Uh, so if you're able to have longer reads uh, to stitch up your things together, like in this very nice figure, uh, then you may be able to more easily separate uh, the different genomes between your sample. And then there's the read binning and reassembly. So using uh, different algorithms, you're able to bin your reads. And then you take the, re the reads from bin one, and then you, assembly, you assemble based on this bin. Uh, I'd rather use the other methods, but uh, there are pretty interesting data using any of these methods. So we, we uh, talked a bit about that earlier in the, in the question. Uh, so this is to estimate the replication rate of bacteria. Uh, a method about that was suggested, I think it was the, from uh, Eran Elinav in Israel that suggested the method first, and then the IREP uh, method was suggested afterwards. Um, so basically, the bacteria replicate from the original replication, and then in theory, if the bacteria, the bacteria is going faster, then you'll have more coverage depth here, than here. So if you calculate the differential, then you're able to estimate the rate of growth of the bacteria. Um, so you get a curve that looks like that. So if it's going fast, then your, your slope will be higher. And if it's growing slow, then it will be about the same uh, for. <coughs> so as Jacques said, we haven't implemented that. Uh, but in theory, it looks good. In practice, that's another question. Uh, then another thing that uh, we can do is we can try to reconstruct metabolic pathways. And this is, is uh, it looks a bit like what uh, Morgan explained, but this is something that is in very big development currently, so that people be able to do flux balance analysis, so really um, systems biology with like differential equation and stuff that are way over my head. Uh, but this is discussed more and more uh, in the different meetings. Um, so to try to understand what's happening in the microbiome by plotting and studying what's happening with, within its uh, metabolic pathways. And so here is a, a website. It's a Canadian initiative, as you can see here. Uh, there are several, uh, Genome Canada, um, Compute Canada. So it's a Canadian initiative about the reconstructed the metabolic pathways found in 50 or something, uh, genome, metagenomes from the Human Microbiome Project. So this is pretty interesting. Uh, I, was, um, I was made aware of that like this week, so I haven't uh, studied this uh, kind of approach that much. Uh, but there is a representation of all the pathways that they have in their models. So it's a pretty cool uh, thing, and you can zoom in so you get all these different uh, pathways. And it may be an approach that has lots of promise uh, for the future. And then you can go a bit further. This is work where they try to find a microbial metabolic influence network. It means that, uh, for example, here uh, you've got, well, I'm not an expert in, it, in all that, so all of this metabolism thing, uh, but they link the different bacteria from the microbiome and from the network with the different um, metabolites that you get. So this is a framework that you could use afterwards to integrate metabolomics and metagenomics. So uh, you may look at the reference here. You've got the uh, and go read the paper. It's a pretty interesting uh, paper. And this kind of approach are getting more and more uh, studied. And they're getting more mature. People have been working on that for a few years. But now it's almost ready for prime time. <laughs> Uh, and finally, the last point I want to touch is the secondary metabolism. Uh, so this made a big, it uh, was a big deal a few uh, years ago, where they found new antibiotics, but in the vaginal microbiome. Uh, so this is, um, these are approaches where you try to find clusters of genes, operons, that look like operons that synthesize natural molecules for like antibiotics or other things. So basically, uh, with, well, and here it says that in different places of the body, there are a lot of different uh, biosynthetic gene clusters that allow to synthesize different 
uh, molecule. So this is the lactosilin, so an antibiotic <coughs> that is discovered using this method. And this lab and others are starting to publish more and more different antibiotics that come from biosynthetic gene clusters. So basically, it looks like a cluster of genes that have uh, different functions, and then with the sequence of the genes, uh, chemists are able to infer the synthesis of molecules. And here, as you can see, they are they come in every shape and size, and they have different distribution between the strains uh, and the different uh, bacteria and different environments. So this is a software that from a Canadian lab. Uh, I think they're from McMaster, so it's called Prism. And what they do is that they annotate the different genes with uh, known uh, domains and genes. And with uh, some machine learning, they're able to infer which molecules will be produced by these genes. So this is kind of a way to de novo uh, discover, based on references, but including some uh, some machine learning in the process to discover new molecules or to infer which molecules will be produced by a bacteria that you have in your population. So this is the different aspects I wanted to touch uh, during, during this course. But one thing that you must not forget is that one E. coli is not like the other one beside it, and one bacteroides is not like the other. They're all a bit different. They may have a slightly different gene set. So as you do your analysis, you must take that into account, that there is a diversity. Uh, two people can have the same taxonomical profile at the family level. But when you look at the genes, it can be totally different. So it is important to keep that in mind in your future analysis. So with your colored assemblies, do you, I guess some of them could be real, as in it could be LGT, or some yeah, could. could be sort of misassemblies. Like if you don't <laughs> try to bother figuring out which is what you just described for now. Yeah, well, we get, as we get more data, we can get more tolerant of risk. Uh, that, that's a bit how I see it. If I have a lot of data, a lot of sequences, and if I do 1% error, but all the information I get from the 99% may be worthwhile for the 1% error. But we haven't characterized the error uh, based on that. But Ray is pretty conservative on its assembly. So that's one of the advantages. It doesn't make that much errors compared to other assemblers like Space, for example. Um, so we tolerate the errors, and we try to be aware of them when we work. But as we get big numbers, then the errors are part of the numbers. Yes? Yeah, so like a cutoff number, uh, how many sort of co-grade weeds or weeds per kilo base cutoff before you decide that the species is present? Uh, yeah, well, if you assemble contigs and you're able to get the four millions of E. coli, then you can expect that this is present. So, uh, but if you're, I have only a few contexts that are from the species, then you can't really say that it is present. And sometimes you can have problems. Uh, for example, we had mice shotgun microbiomes, and in the profiling, we did not include the mouse genome. And in the mouse genomes, there are some value sequences that have chemers that look a lot like an, I don't remember which bacteria. So when we did the analysis without the like the, the, the reference of the of the mice, then we had some taxa that appeared that seemed to be very very important, but they were not. So we rerun the thing using the mice, and then we got a proper analysis. So that's one of the things with Ray Meta is that it allows you to give it the background and it includes it in the analysis. Mm -hmm.